Well, hello, this is Vincent Green, and we're going to continue our study of the book of Genesis today. We're in chapter 3. We've been in chapter 3 for a few sessions, and we've still got some sessions to go before we go to chapter 4. But in this Toliadot uh, section, this first Toliadot started in chapter 2, verse 4, going all the way to the end of chapter 4. This section of Genesis is telling us what happened after God created. And, and basically what you see is the entrance of sin into this world. That's what you see. At every turn, you see sin coming into this world. And what is sin? Well, we see the nature of sin in this passage. We see the consequences of sin in this passage. We're now looking at the curse of sin uh, in, in this section of Scripture. We will also see its effects. That's where we're headed after the curse. So the, the sin itself is disloyalty to God. It's distrusting God. It's coming to the point in your life where, and we are sinful by nature, we're born with this inclination. That's why we're totally depraved. That's why we're born with original sin. We are born with the idea that, that we cannot trust God fully for everything. We're not loyal to him. That's what sin is. At its essence, we were created to be in relationship with our God. We were created to be in, in, a, in a communion with Him, dependency upon Him. That's how He created us. That's how He made us. But sin says, no, I want to be independent from God. Sin says, I want to do what I want to do. And I want to do it my way because I think I can do life better than I can through Him. And so sin is the opposite of what we were designed to be, of what we were created to be, of what God made us to be. So salvation, having our sins forgiven, repenting from our sins, and having them covered by the blood of the Lamb who came and died on the cross for us, Jesus, the Son of God, by having salvation, it's a blessed salvation, it is a glorious salvation, as the writer of Hebrews would tell us it's a great salvation. Why? Because what God does in that salvation is restore to us our eternal destiny for the reason and the way in which we were created and for the purpose for which we were created. That's what salvation is. That's what being redeemed is. And there's, there's a lot of detail to that. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot to understand and unpack in regards to all of that. And that's what the scriptures uh, teach us from Genesis to the book of Revelation, from beginning to end. But as we walk through this chapter, we see the effects of sin, the curse of sin, the condemnation of sin, everything. In regards to sin, we see the, that which it became the problem, that which... God would solve through the death of his son. We see that here on display. And so we're now to the point where the man is being cursed. We've seen God curse the Satan, the serpent and Satan. We've seen God curse the woman. Now he's cursing the man. Everybody gets their stake. Everybody, uh, God talks to each one. Nobody's left out here. And so last time we began to look at the man uh, at the beginning of verse 17. And I told you that these cursings, the cursing upon Satan, the serpent, and the cursing upon the woman, and as, as with them, it will be with the man. These are a series of proclamations that God is making against each individual. And it's, so, it's as though God is setting in stone certain parameters because of the sin, because of the act, because of the, the sin in the heart. And so he's already spoken to Satan, and Satan's going to be defeated. Satan's not going to win. He thinks he could win, but he's not. He's now already spoken to the woman, and now he addresses the man. So let me read verse 17 through verse 19. and. Um, this is our section. We Again, last time we began verse 17, the goal today would be to, to get through verse 19, if at all possible. So it says, and to the man, he said this, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life, you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, 
Though you will eat of its grains, by the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. So this is a judicial sentence that God places upon the man, a judicial sen sentence. He says, since you, he starts with, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat. We looked at that one in detail last time, and I ended by telling you that when you think about God being the judge, it's not about um, why did God allow them to live. That is his grace. In other words, the point I wanted to make is that God is the supreme judge, and he judges based on, based on him, based on his rationale, based on his reasoning. He does not have to get our approval for what he does. See, mankind thinks that God, that, that, that God needs to get mankind's approval for everything. No. God is in charge. That's the part about God being sovereign. It's by his grace and his mercy that he allows you to be able to even have the Bible, to even have his revelation, to be able to understand his thoughts, to be able to understand what he's trying to tell you. It's not only his grace and mercy that would bring you to salvation. It's his grace and mercy because of his love that would even show uh, you the revelation of the knowledge of his will. And God in his grace, even though he said, you will die, for Adam and for Eve, it's not instantaneous. And the one thing we do learn is because God's going to redeem them. We'll see that once we get down to verse 26 and 27. I'm sorry, uh, verse 20 and 21. We'll see that when we get to there. But the whole basis for the curse that's about to be placed upon the man is because of him listening to his wife and eating from the tree. He was not deceived as she was. It doesn't make her less culpable. She is culpable just as much as he is, but he willingly, deliberately ate from the tree. And the command that God had given him, even before Eve was created, as we saw in chapter 2, that command he violated wholesale. And so here's the curse. Here's the curse itself. This is component number two of this section, verses 17, 18, and 19. Since you had listened to your wife, ate from the tree. I commanded you not to eat from it. Here's what's going to happen. The ground is cursed because of you. The ground is cursed with all uh, because of you. What does that mean? The man was created to till the ground, right? To till the soil, to cultivate it. God had created the earth and was going to make it, had made it to be that which the man would cultivate, but it wasn't going to be laborious. It wasn't going to be a struggle. It wasn't going to be um, hardship. Now it will be. The man is tied to the ground. The man is tied to the earth. And now it is going to be cursed. And it's because of you. So the idea of, of the ground being cursed, that means it, it, has, it takes on a different functionality. It takes on a different functionality. Why is it going to be cursed? Because of him. It's to be just like for Eve. It's to be a daily reminder of his sin against God. The hardship of life. Even in Job, Eliphaz, who was not the best counselor, by the way, but he does say this that's truthful. Evil does not spring from the soil. Trouble does not sprout from the earth. People are born for trouble as readily as sparks fly up from a fire. 
The ground didn't cause the sin. The ground was not the one that sinned. The ground is an inanimate object. It has no reasoning capability to it. But the ground is affected by the sin of the man. And that's what God is telling them. You know what's interesting? In the Hebrew, the word for man is Adam. <coughs> the word for ground is Adama, <laughs> because he comes from the ground. Mankind was created by God to have a relationship with the ground. Why is that? The ground is the source of the food chain. That is how he will live. That's how he will sustain himself at a physical level. And so God created the earth for the man. He created the ground for the man to be able to till it and, and, and work with it. And it would bring forth the fruit of abundance. And that way, mankind would live according to it. You know, even in the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth, there's going to be a new earth. That new earth is going to be for us who are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be magnificent. Beyond imagination. Beyond any words we could imagine. Just this heaven and earth. You see the power that God has to create this heaven and earth. What about the future one? But this one is cursed. And it's going to remain that way for quite a while. And it's still cursed to this day. See, the woman, she engages in the battle for holiness and happiness in regards to the family. We looked at that when God cursed the woman. For the man, it's going to be in the battle for the food necessary for him and his family, his wife and his children to support the family. So the man's going to have to be battling sin within the heart, just as the woman has to battle it. But he's also going to have to find that the very ground for which should provide for him the food that is needed and the substance that's needed, it's not going to willfully submit to him. And what you find out here is that paradise is gone. It's not going to operate like it was originally designed. Sin has changed that. And Paul will even talk about that the creation groans for the day of redemption. I mean, it's, it's as though it's, it's the same as Psalm 19, where it says creation uh, without a voice, without words, speaks. And it declares the glory of God. But it also is groaning for the curse to be lifted. There's droughts. There's famines. There's earthquakes. There's problems from every aspect of the globe. And it's all because of sin. It's all because of sin. And notice how he expands on this. He says, all your life, all your life, you will struggle to scratch a living from it. Just to scratch a living. It's going to be toil, misery, sorrow, labor. All of your life is going to be difficult. Every aspect of it. You want to get an idea, a picture of what a blessed ground looks like? In Deuteronomy chapter 33, Moses says these words. May their land be blessed. Talking about the tribes of Joseph. May their lands be blessed by the Lord with the precious gift of dew from the heavens and water from beneath the earth, with the rich fruit that grows in the sun and the rich harvest produced each month, with the finest crops of the ancient mountains and the abundance from the everlasting hills, with the best gifts of the earth and its bounty and the favor of the one who appeared in the burning bush. May these blessings rest on Joseph's head, crowning the brow of the prince among his brothers. Joseph has the, the majesty of a young bull. He has horns of a wild ox. He will gore distant nations, even to the ends of the earth. This is my blessing for the multitudes of Ephraim and the thousands of Manasseh. You get a little picture there of, of even under sin, the, the land kind of being 
blessed or being blessed in a way that even tries to overcome the cursing that is placed upon the ground. When it says it's a cursed ground, that means there's going to be times lack of water. There's going to be problems with the soil. There's going to be problems with the weeds, the elements. There's going to be weather issues. You're going to have destructive animals, birds, insects that want to kill the crop. And that's the way it's been since the garden. The ground is cursed. And that causes the struggle. The struggle. You know there is going to come a day when the curse will be fully lifted. Mm -hmm. In the future, it's called the Millennial Kingdom. It's after the Tribulation period. The, earth, uh, the curse is going to be lifted. In Isaiah chapter 30, Isaiah chapter 30, Verse 23, the Lord will bless you with rain at planting time. There will be wonderful harvests and plenty of pasture land for your livestock. The oxen and donkeys that till the ground will eat good grain. It's chaff blown away by the wind. Because he's talking about in that day. Verse 26, the moon will be bright as the sun. The sun will be seven times brighter. This is the time when the Lord will begin to heal his people and cure the wounds he has given them. And that's not speaking of the exile or the return from the exile. Speaking of a different time period. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 15 until at last the Spirit is poured out on us from heaven. Then the wilderness will become a fertile field, and the fertile field will yield bountiful crops. Has the wilderness done that? Go look at Saudi Arabia. Look at the Sinai Peninsula. Look at all the desert areas that, that are in the Middle East. It just They're still desert. Been that way for years. But this is when justice will rule in the wilderness. Righteousness in the fertile field. Speaking of a future time that is not now, Isaiah 35, 35 verses 1 to 10 says, Even the wilderness and desert will be glad in those days. The wasteland will rejoice and blossom with spring uh, crocuses. I'm not sure what that is. I have to look that one up. Yes, there will be an abundance of flowers uh, and singing and joy. The deserts will become as green as the mountains of Lebanon as lovely as Mount Carmel or the plain of Sharon. There the Lord will display his glory, the splendor of our God. With this news, strengthen, strengthen those who have tired hands and encourage those who have weak knees. Say, with the, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong and do not fear, for your God is coming to destroy your enemies. He is coming to save you. Says the... Um, the lame will leap like a deer. Those who cannot speak will sing for joy. He's going to open the eyes of the blind. He's going to unplug the ears of the deaf. Springs will gush forth in the wilderness. Streams will water the wasteland. The parched ground will become a pool. Springs of water will satisfy the thirsty land. March grass and reeds and rushes will flourish where desert jackals once lived. And even more is coming. You can also go to Isaiah chapter 41, verse 18, Isaiah 43, verse 19, Isaiah 55, verse 12. That is, that is the curse being lifted, but not now. Right now, it is the ground is cursed because of your sin, Adam, and it's going to be a struggle to work with the field all, it says, all your life, all your life. The idea of struggling it's struggle to scratch a living. It's really just one concept. It's going to be difficult. You're going to be reminded over and over and over again that this world is cursed because of your sin. You're going to be constantly reminded of it. That's the idea of the struggle. It's never going to cease. You know, for me, I'm praying for a day we have self-cleaning kitchens where we don't have to do anything to clean the kitchen. 
That would be a great day. But you know what? The kitchen, because I wash dishes, I help my wife with all of that every day. I realize every day the kitchen is cursed. The whole world is cursed. The whole creation is cursed. This is an interesting psalm. Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, because it's God who gives rest to his loved ones. Life is toil. Life is struggle. And God made it so. God set that into stone when he spoke to Adam to remind him of his constant sins and to remind him that what, what, what is sin? It's, it's saying, God, I don't want to be dependent on you. Psalm 127 says you can do everything you want to do, humanly speaking. You can, you can, build, you can work all day long building whatever and, and doing whatever to think you can guard stuff. If you think you can do this in your strength, try it again. Because you're going to struggle, it's not going to work. Only the Lord is the one who makes things happen. The issue is your perspective. Do you understand? Do you see the reality that God is God, that he is sovereign and for everything, even your breath, even every breath that you breathe is a gift from God. That is his mercy to allow you to live. But sin clouds your mind, it clouds your heart, it clouds your perspective. It says, no, I'm the captain of my own fate. Well, the daily struggle of life is to remind you that sin is here. It's to speak to that every day. And, and for Adam, it's all his life. And you want to know how many years he lived? We find out in chapter 5, 930. Think about 930 years living in wickedness, living in sin, living with the concept of struggle. You're like, oh my goodness. You know, our life now, we may live 85 at best, maybe 90. There are some who live to be over 100. But think about it. Think about living 930 years. That's what it was like for Adam. To live that long, living and toiling and struggling in a, in a cursed ground, toil, misery, it's unbelievable. And so you see that it's, it's just going to be rough. He says even in verse 18, he says, it's going to grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. There's, in a sense, a positive and a negative here. The, the ground's going to be cursed, but on the positive, you'll still be able to eat from it. You'll still be able to eat from the produce, but it's going to grow thorns and thistles. That's the, that's, thorns is that which grows up and it can, you know, prick you. Thistles are the weeds and, and everything. It, it's, the, it's, it's. It, these are terms used to describe that it's going not it's going to be hard and difficult and a pain to have to deal with just trying to survive in this world and make it each and every day and even with technology and even with all the modern advances to cultivate food there's still people people have more anxiety today about living daily life than they probably did back then. I mean, it is the thing is, is that God has set it in stone that you're going to have to live with the consequences of sin, here we go, every single day of your life. Even as a believer, even though we know that God has saved us and transformed us and that brings us joy, it brings us peace, we still are in this sin-cursed earth until he takes us out of it. And there's a reason for all of that. That even comes later in this chapter. And we'll look at that. Again, chapter 3 deals with a lot of issues, tells us a lot of things, uh, uh, answers a lot of questions. 
But God still has a uh, uh, mercy and grace. He will allow you to eat of its grains, even though it's going to be difficult to toil. On the one hand, you're going to be reminded every day, every moment of your sin. On the other hand, God is still giving you grace. And the grace, if, if you want to, you know, you're seeing his mercy on the one hand, the toil and the reminder of sin on the other. And so that grace and that mercy, just in giving you provision, it's like Jesus saying, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. If you understand that God is it's what we what we call common grace, there's a level of common grace from God given to everyone that's common to all, that everyone experiences. And that grace, if, remember God, uh, I think Paul mentions in Romans that God's patience is to lead you to repentance, right? And so the idea is that God gives you a certain amount of grace and mercy and, and but at the same time he, he sets it in stone so you're reminded of your sin. Why? Because he wants your heart to come to him. He wants you to think about him. He wants you to return to him, repent from your sins and turn to him in faith. It's all a reminder. It's all to bring you to the place where you repent of your sin. Well, I got to preaching again. But you get the point. That's what this pronouncement is. It's a reminder to Adam that life is going to be difficult. You need to be reminded of your sin every day. You need to realize what you have done by your actions and by your by the thoughts in your heart. You have sinned against me. God is not the bad guy here. God did not sin. He's perfect in every way. Who sinned? Adam and Eve. And also you and I. We're the one responsible for our sin. A lot of people who remain in their sin think that they need to fix God. No. The problem's with us, not with God. Be glad and be grateful that he allows you to eat of his grains. That means you get to keep living physically. He gives you at least a number of years. That's why you find out in the book of Hebrews, quoting the Old Testament, today is the day of salvation. You have a day. You have today. You have, you have time to be able to recognize your own sinfulness. And how many people live their whole life and don't even think about it? They just keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. Well, verse 19, finish up with this. You see, we've seen the cause of the, cur uh, of, the, of, of the curse upon a man. God talks about the curse itself. Now the consequences of the curse. By the sweat of your brow, there's three statements made here. Let's take each one of them. By the sweat of your brow, you have... Will you have food to eat? So these are the consequences. I've already kind of spoken about that. You, you take what was in verse 18 and put it together. And the conclusion is it's going to be difficult. The sweat shows the, you know what sweat does? It shows the exhausting effort Adam would need to work. I learned this. Sweat is a mechanism in your body that forces you to cool down. See, when you're expending too much energy as you're working, doing your labor, you, your body is expending too much energy at one point in time, so your body needs to cool down. So God created a mechanism in your body called sweat. You start feeling it, right? And it helps your body cool down. It's a, it's a physical thing. So, Meaning, it's a, so why is that term used here? So imagine, Adam, you're going to have to work hard. You're going to have to expend a lot of energy to have food to eat, to provide for yourself and for your family and all those children you're going to have for 930 years. You're, you're going to have to do a lot of work. This is Life is not going to be easy. It's going to be a pain. Can you relate? <laughs> it's going to be a pain. And, 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 and you're going to feel it at a physical level. There's going to be struggle. Can I have an amen? Are you, you're going to have struggle. This is how life is going to be. It's called hard work. And you get someone like Solomon who looks at that, feels the hard work, and says it's all pointless. 
No, it's not pointless. It reminds you, it's to remind you of your sinfulness. It's going to be struggle. You're going to have to work for the food. To have food to eat, you're going to have to work for it, and you're going to have to struggle to get it. And then, statement number two, until you return to the ground from which you were made. What is that? Death. Death is going to occur. For Adam, it took 930 years before his body gave out and died, before it was time. You and I won't live that long in this life. Praise the Lord. Could you imagine living 930 years in wickedness? I think I've said that already or asked that question already. But the point here is that not only are you going to, the consequence of the curse, here's the deal. Here's what I'm locking into stone. Adam, you are going to physically die. Death will come. And he's talking about physical death because you're going to return to the ground from which you were made. So he's speaking of the physical aspect of the life. There's no ifs about it. 100 or out of 100 people die. 10 out of 10 people die. Every person dies. There's only two people who never died. Unredeemed people. Enoch, who we'll meet in Genesis 5, and Elijah. And there will be people in the future who are living at the moment when Christ comes to rapture us out. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 Thessalonians 2. When God comes and to rapture us, take us out before the tribulation period begins, guess what? There are going to be people who are alive and they won't physically die. But for everybody else, death comes. And that's the majority. So he's saying that's going to happen. So the idea of until, until, till the moment, that's future looking, okay? That's a term that's future looking, till you return to the ground. This is where God made him. God sends him back to it. And like I said, Solomon looks at all that as well and says, well, it's all meaningless. No. Death is how God ushers you into his presence. I got more to say about that, but that comes later in the chapter. The final aspect of the consequences, the third item here, verse 19 for you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. And you can look at that and just say, well, that's just a repetition. That's just a repetition. But it, 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 it adds, it, when it says F-O-R, that means it provides additional reasoning. So all these are connected. But there's an idea here of separation. You were made from the dust. To the dust you're going to return. What I had used to bring you into this world you're going to go back to, there's going to be a separation, an alienation is the idea. You're going to experience that. You're not, you're not going to live forever in this world. The idea is you were created. You were created to live forever in this world, but now there's death. Now there's death. And that's why there has to be an uncreation of this world. New heaven, or the present heavens and the earth melting away with fervent heat, as Peter will tell us. Then the new creation, because God says I'm making all things new, a new creation of the new heavens and the new earth that are prophesied and spoken about in Isaiah, 2 Peter, and also the book of Revelation. A totally new creation. So there's going to be an uncreation of the present heavens and the earth, and it will not take seven days or six days. It's going to happen just like that. And then there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth that's going to happen like that. And we see that in Scripture, and that's our eternal home. For those of us who have been redeemed and have that great salvation, we our destiny has been restored, and our destiny will be lived out forever and ever and ever in the new heaven and the new earth. God will give us a home. He tells the disciples that in John chapter 14. There will be no more 
separation or alienation. We're going to be back with our God. And here it says, though, what Adam is being told is that you live this life and you're done and, and it's over. You were made from the dust. You're going to go back to it. And left in that state, you are separated from God forever. Because if you are, if you die in your sins, you go to hell. You go to the lake of fire in the future at the great white throne. What is, what is characteristic of all that is that that place which people go who die without the salvation from God, who are, who are not the redeemed, they are eternally separated, alienated from God forever and ever and ever. Now, in this present life, they have the opportunity to hear from God, to hear him speak through his word, to hear the preaching of the word of God, to hear the truth of the word of God proclaimed, and they have an opportunity. Today is the day of salvation. But if they die in their sins for eternity, they're apart from apart from God. Total alienation. Total separation. Jesus will even kind of hint at this in a way in Matthew chapter 6. Talks about they have their reward. Like they have it now. But don't worry. The eternity is going to be different for them. The curse of is real. The curse is real. No way around it. We need to recognize that. We need to understand that. So, where do we go from here? Starting at chapter 3, verse 20. Going all the way down to chapter 4, verse 15. Sorry, verse 16. You see the effects of sin. Now, on the one hand, there's the positive effects of sin. You say, how can sin have positive effects? Well, there is. It's interesting how it's played out. But that's chapter 3, verse 20, through uh, the end of the chapter, verse 24. The negative effects is chapter 4, verse 1, through verse 16. So we're going to see the contrast. That's where, that's where we're headed going to be beginning to look at the contrast. Remember, today is the day of salvation. If you don't know Christ, this curse is upon you. And even those of us who are truly born again, we still live in a sin-cursed earth. It's just we have the presence of the Holy Spirit to endure it, to persevere, to, to have joy in the midst of the pain, to have joy in the midst of the sorrow. But for those who do not know the Lord, they don't have true Deep, lasting joy. Wow. That's why we have to pray. That's why we have to preach. That's why we have to share. That's why we have to minister. Let's pray. Dear God, we do thank you again for this time to look at your word, to be able to learn these valuable truths. Lord, when we understand what the curse is all about, we, we, we understand the sense of your purpose behind it. And why the world is the way it is. The sin cursed earth is to be a reminder to us of our sin, which we ever live with. Even those of us who know you, we're not, we still battle. We're not perfect beings. And we're reminded of that every day. But Lord, you have called us and chosen us and brought us to yourself changed our life, given us new hearts. Wow. And Lord, I pray for those who are watching this series of messages and teachings uh, through the book of Genesis. If they don't know you, if they don't know your saving grace, if they've never been truly born again, that you would convict them, that you would change them, bring them to yourself. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for watching, and we're going to continue next time. We're going to begin to look at verse 20 through verse 24. It's going to take a few sessions, still going through this, so I want you to understand it. But it's a wonderful, wonderful study. Take care.
Talk to you later. We'll see you next time.